Hello and welcome to the GC9X Postmortem. I'm Carl. And this is Snarboo. Joining us today is a man whose passion for Star Fox is so intense, he has an arch nemesis named Wolf. Dr. Allosaurus. Hey. And it's okay if we call you Doc, right? You won't kill us if we do that. Yeah, right? that's fine. Okay. And with that said, this week's game really doesn't need too much of an introduction. It's the 1993 smash hit from Nintendo, Star Fox, also known as Starwing in Europe. Is there any reason to introduce Nintendo? Someone's going to have done a better job than we're ever going to do. Yeah, we might as well. We've done that for the last three or so videos. Nintendo was founded in the late 1800s. As a Hanafuda <laughs> card company or something, right? Yeah, they made cards for gambling purposes. And then, a score or so years before their 100th birthday, they started getting involved with electronic games. They published the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan, scoring a massive hit with Miyamoto's Donkey Kong in 1981 in the arcades. They went on to produce the Nintendo Famicom in 1983, released overseas as the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 to massive popular acclaim. Riding high on a triad of great games, great timing, and not-so-great licensing terms, they were the undisputed console king. By the early 90s, Nintendo, still going strong, but rapidly engaging in competition with the upstart Sega system, the Mega Drive, had seriously threatened Nintendo's overwhelming dominance of the market. Unable to completely rely on third-party support, Nintendo clearly wanted a strong response to Sega, and in a way that Sega couldn't answer. This task fell upon a British company, Argonaut, Together, the companies began a port of Argonaut's earlier Star Glider title. Seeing that the SNES didn't have the power to do what they wanted, Argonaut requested to Nintendo that they be allowed to create some extra hardware. Somewhat surprisingly, Nintendo agreed and cut them a check for a million dollars. Developing a 3D graphics accelerator and an early RISC microprocessor, while Nintendo handled the majority of the game's design work, and audio and visual design, launching to reasonable fanfare in Japan in February of 93, and to possibly greater success in March of the same year in the US. With astoundingly impressive graphics and quality Nintendo design, there's no surprise Star Fox was popular when it landed. So let's break down to the good people of Carnaria what it's like to take control of an R-Wing. I would actually just like to take an aside as the reason why they probably were okay with them Argonaut manufacturing a custom chip. As far as I know, the for the for the NES, it was actually a pretty common tactic to actually, you know, if your if the system couldn't do something, just to you know build a chip and put it in the cart itself. I know that there was a few games that did that, Castlevania 3 most notably. So it wasn't a tactic that was completely alien to Nintendo at the time. Um, Sega's answer to that was just to release a console add-on, as far as I can tell. Hence the Sega CD and later the 32X. But yeah, well, the story. SNES had been designed specifically in mind for expansive carts. That's why the actual SNES isn't super powerful, considering it launched after the Genesis. Yeah. It's a very unusual tactic, but again, they did it with the NES, and it probably made sense at the time, because they probably foresaw the issue with manufacturing a completely separate console add-on, namely, the they kind of ran into some troubles with, I think, the Famicom disk system. Like, it just, piracy was a huge issue for one thing, and then I don't think it was very popular for another. So the default control scheme is as follows. The A button fires a Nova Bomb, and if you press it again, it actually makes it explode. Something I did not actually know until I started reading the script for this. That's, wow, that would have come in very handy. <laughs> yeah. It makes several of the fast-moving bosses quite easy. Okay, so the B button is the brake for control schemes A and C, or it fires your blasters for control B or control schemes B and D. X uses your boost. Y fires your blaster for control schemes A and C, or brakes for control schemes B and D. They basically just swap the brake and fire buttons. That's why you have those few different control schemes. Okay, so start is pause, obviously. Select actually switches between uh, multiple viewpoints. You have two for the ground and then three for the air. The the one that's missing on the ground is a first-person view. I'm not sure why they disabled that for the ground ones. I guess because of the fixed perspective to begin with, so it wasn't really that important. The major difference between control schemes A and B and C and D in terms of movement is that for A and B, it's typical flight, flight um, sim controls. That is, down causes the R-wing to move up or to uh, tilt up. 
and then up causes it to tilt down, or I forget the exact um, flight terms for that. Left and right uh, is obviously the same for both. Are you talking about pitch? Yeah, it causes you to pitch up and down. And if you think about how the uh, rudders in a um, plane works, it kind of makes sense why, you know, pulling the control stick towards you actually causes it to pull up. But that's another story for another time, and I'm sure, you know, there are plenty of people out there who know more about it than I do, so you can probably look it up. Uh, left and right is always the same. Uh, L and R are actually, they, they allow you to turn your R wing sideways. That allows you to, like, uh, duck through narrow corridors and such. I but think you move faster to left and right, correct? That's, yeah, I believe it does allow you to do, it allows you uh, to move faster while banking, I think is the term. But it has another uh, hidden, slightly hidden feature. I'm not sure if it was listed in the manual. It probably was, but they don't mention it tells this. Tells you in the game. training. Oh, does it yeah. tell you to do barrel? Yep. Okay. I actually, well, I, I could have sworn I didn't read that in the training. It didn't mention it, but. No, nah, definitely the training is actually. It, it's quite when cool you're doing the training. formation part, I think. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, so if you t double tap either left or right, you'll do a barrel roll, which has the handy feature of not causing you to die if something is shooting directly at you. That seems to be it. It just deflects fire or allows you to dodge it much better than you would normally. Yeah. So as noted, the game has a few controller presets, but the standard controls should work well for most people. Okay, so something to note about the barrel roll is that it's kind of finicky. It's it's something that um, I know Cal could only do reliably about 90% of the time. I didn't actually remember how to do the barrel roll until much, much later after I was playing this game. I thought you had to alternate left and right for some reason. I'm not sure why. You can why. do that, actually. Does that actually work, too? It, it works. Oh, okay. It, but, it's, but it's just as finicky as doing a normal one, so there's really no point to it. It was actually really no much harder than, uh, just double tapping it for me, because I, I tried alternating the two, and at 90, or like 90% of the time it wouldn't work. It was the exact opposite if I just double tapped. So it's it's a bit tricky. Um, as far as I can tell, the reason for that is the, the frame rate issues. Yeah. The skin has. And it's not the good kind of slowdown that happens in some shmups where you can actually move, you know, you can dodge things better. Here, it just makes the controls pretty much turn to, like, like putty. Like, it's impossible to, like, move. Yeah, sluggish. Similar to games like Solvalu and Starblade, or even your standard light gun games, Star Fox is quite linear, and you fly through a course shooting waves of various enemies. However, unlike those titles and similar to Afterburner or Space Harrier, your default view is behind the R-Wing to aid in dodging and spatial awareness, which is quite important because you spend a lot of the time dodging unkillable obstacles. I'd say there's quite a big focus on set pieces, which is where it feels like it's separated from Sega's line of games. It makes it feel a lot closer to Namco's arcade shooters, which were an admitted influence on the game's design. I honestly believe in some ways that this game is actually a bit of a response to Spacer, or it's a take on that sort of formula. I don't know if Sega was the first to do that sort of gameplay style. I can't remember which which of those behind the backs or you know 3D shmup style games came first. Actually, wait, it would be Cube Quest or Tempest. So anyway, ignoring that because they're way far removed. In any case, the notable difference between this and games like Space Harrier, Afterburner, Thunderblade, you know, Galaxy Force, um, you name it, is that there's an emphasis on fine aiming, like. Oftentimes, enemies will have very tiny hitboxes or, you know, like weak points. And the goal is less, you know, like where you are on the screen at any given time and more where your um, cursor is pointing or, well, I should, I, I say cursor, but you only, the only time you actually see a crosshair in this game is if you're playing the space stages in our, in first person view. Otherwise, it's sort of, you just sort of have to intuitively know where the R-Wing is pointing its main blaster at. I never really found that a problem, though. Like, you'd think it would be this huge issue, but I'd say, you know, after a stage or two, you, you do sort of genuinely have an idea of where you're aiming. And yeah. Stuff. I think it might also have a little bit of auto-aim. I haven't actually tested this to confirm. Oh, well, that could be that could be possible, because there, there are times when your ship's going down, you're shooting, and it's still going straight towards an enemy. Hmm. Um, I do feel that the hitboxes are kind of... They're definitely larger than the enemy models, so you yeah. can hit them even with some shots that you would have expected to miss. That's kind of a double-edged sword, though, because it seems like the R-Wing's hitbox is actually much, much larger than the actual model. And oh, they absolutely are. That's my you, biggest issue with this game, besides the frame rate. It's definitely points, especially if you're in third-person view, um, and you fly past uh, one of the obstacles, 
that you can see through in Sector Z. You can like you can just watch as the obstacle clearly misses you, but then you take a hit. Yeah. That happens in the Armada stage too, though, when dodging some of the obstacles. I could have sworn my R wing had actually swooped over like the pillars and um, obstacles inside of the ships, but it actually still hit like the very bottom or the very top of it. Yeah, well, a good actually a good example is um, in Coronaria when you can fly between the buildings. Oh yeah, that's right. a good example. Even because with that, banking, it can cause yeah, issues. You're, you're banking, and you definitely feel like you should be making it through. Yeah. But then you'll get hit. Like, at first, I wasn't sure I was supposed to even be able to fly through it, but they put like a bomb at the end of it, so yep. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I can. Which obviously is the Nintendo intuitive style of telling you that you can do this, but it's really picky about your angle of entry. Yeah, that, that frustrated me a lot when I was a kid because I would always see that bomb and I'd always try to grab it. I never could do it perfectly because I'd always hit something. One difference between a lot of other games of this type that came previous to it, um, in Star Fox, your effectively your cursor guides your ship around. In games like Afterburner and, or at least I think in Afterburner, but definitely in Space Harrier, you control your character on screen, and your aim is just dictated where your character ends up. Whereas in this game, what you're aiming, your R-Wing will follow your aim, which I feel, it feels different to playing one of those titles. And I believe that's why they put an emphasis on accuracy in this game and like hitting like tiny hit points and such, is because of the, because the way that you move the R-Wing, it's actually different than how it works in Space Harrier as well. Because in Space Harrier, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like there's this grid that you move, um, you know, what is the name of the character in Space Harrier? Is it just the Harrier? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I and think everyone falls in the Harrier. You're basically moving on a two-dimensional grid through a 3D space at any time. So, like, if you're, like, on the top corner of the screen, you're always still pointing into the same general direction forward. But Star Fox takes an even further more 3D... Or the way Star Fox's aim works is more 3D than that. Instead of being a essentially a 2D grid that the, that the R-Wing is flying on, you know, going through a 3D space, it's actually fully 3D. The R-Wing can actually tilt from side to side. You know, it can change its pitch, it can change its raw, yaw, and roll, and that actually does affect the way that you aim in the game. Because it's not just always constantly firing forward, it can also fire at a slight angle, up and down. There's a real sense of freedom in controlling the, the R-Wing around. You don't feel, you feel like you're moving a crop through space. Right rather than you're just moving in a in a grid or something as you said it's, you do feel like you're just you're flying around and you don't notice that there's any sort of well you don't notice the video game aspect of it you feel like you're piloting a crop it's kind of an odd marrying of two different styles it's you know you have those early 3d free roaming action games combined with you know the restricted sort of three-dimensional movement of a game like space Harrier, or galaxy force and so on so the basic gist of Star Fox is, it's sort of your typical arcade shooter. You fly around and you've got things to shoot, but you've got some obstacles you got to go through. Like sometimes you'll have to go through a gate to grab a power-up. You could normally just go around the gate, but if you want to grab that power-up, you'd have to go through it. Basically, you had the whole 3D engine that was revolutionary at the time. Like you, if, like if you uh, hit the ground with your wings, they would snap off or if you just got hit in a certain position. I'd say a big part of this game is the bosses, to me, strike me as something completely different for a game of this time. Yeah, the bosses at the time. They'd have like various weak points that you'd have to hit. Like the first boss, it's like this attack carrier and it would open up like it's a uh, missile ports and start shooting at you. Well, that was your chance to strike at it. Because that's, that's something that really stood out to me for this game, yeah. was when I was playing it, I was like, wow, the bosses are, they're basically shmup bosses, but in 3D. Right. Like, they're very complicated, they can do a lot of different features, they use their mass, they sort of move around the screen, they've got a surprising diverse array of bosses too. It's comparable to punch out in a way if you think about it because every boss has like a pattern that you have to memorize and if you want to beat it you have to know what they're gonna do. And they also have the specific weakening points or weaknesses with the way they attack the player too. Right. One thing that I was kind of bothered me about the bosses though is they have this tendency to have fake weak points. Like not all right. the bosses but sometimes you know the weak point is usually like a red and yellow flashing thing. Yeah. But Sometimes you can see red and yellow flashing things, and you shoot them and it doesn't seem to do anything. Like, several of the bosses have this, or 
you can't actually shoot the weak point. It will, there's a special trigger time when you're allowed to hit it, but then you can't hit it if it's not flashing, or it's like it's not flashing in the right spot. Right. Here's the thing I, I think about that is the uh, some of the weak points are just like the engines or something, and they were just trying to show like that the afterburner effect or whatever. I also didn't like the fact that because the controls, and this is one of the things that I think this game is fairly unique on, I'm pretty sure Afterburner 2 had a turbo button. It did. But as we mentioned in the controls, you can speed up and slow down the R wing yeah. using rockets, which is, is gonna, really cool. And you're going to need that for um, certain levels because you'll have like meteorites flying at you and sometimes you'll just need to take it slow or sometimes you need to boost through before a door closes on you. Yeah, I, I thought that was, that was a cool feature because that's a lot harder to do with a 2D game because a lot of those games, the movement of the character is what fakes the 3D effect. When you stop moving, everything has to sort of stop moving in this kind of jarring fashion. Whereas, because this is full 3D, it, well, mostly, predominantly full 3D, it's got a right. better effect. One thing is though, sometimes the game responds quite awkwardly uh, to using retro rockets. I found that some of the bosses don't respond in the way you might expect. Right. Like, the boss of Fortuna, the dragon, yeah. sometimes I think he can, like, sit down on the ground, but then you use boost or you use slow down, and he still stays in the exact same position. The boss of the meteorite, or the meteor, does that too, the weird spinning thing, because I swear I was the using... The crusher. Yeah, I was trying to use the retro rockets to, like, slow down, obviously, you know, so it wouldn't hit me, but it actually matched my speed, so it was more about where I was on the screen than necessarily yeah. my speed. And like, I understand because that's a balance for the boss fight, but because most of the game you have a freedom of movement, it, it is jarring to just suddenly be like, wait, why is my rockets not working? Also, the edges of the screen kind of are a bother with the way the engine works. Like if you, you know, you move to the, say you're trying to dodge an obstacle that's coming at you when you move to the top left, yeah. and the obstacle sort of moves to the top left anyway, like you think that you could jet over it because it's sort of coming directly at you, but then it sort of moves up and then you can't, because obviously you can't move everywhere. You do have a fixed degree of movement. Yeah. And sometimes it can be really awkward when it looks like you think you can go to the side of an obstacle, but then you go to the side and it doesn't let you. But there are other points where you can dodge the side, like in Corneria, you, there's the buildings that come at you and yeah. you can go to the left or right of the buildings, like when there's a big set of buildings. But then sometimes you can't move around an obstacle, like it's just the obstacles programmed to take up like most of the screen. Right. This especially happens with some of the bosses where they might just be on the left and you just can't, be you can't the go to the left because they will be on the entire left. It's sort of like the first boss where if you're just standing up there, you're going to get hit even if you don't know what's coming. That was a real cheap shot. The first boss can basically insta-kill you if you have never fought him before because he just right. arrives from the top. I think in Star Fox 64, because that level is very similar to what they remade it in Star Fox 64, I think they actually warn you that he's coming. Yeah. Like, someone chimes in and says, Ah, the boss is coming up behind us, or look out, Fox, or something. That's just like, oh, what, what's going on? Whereas I, I think in this one, it just starts like, there's a boss coming or something. Someone says something, maybe. Does but, the game? Does this game actually warn you if there are enemies behind you? Because I noticed there are some times where there are arrows that appear on certain sides of the screen, but I can never figure out what that meant. I think it's I, just warning you to get back to the middle, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, wasted there opportunity. Are, there are some opportunity. There are some points where enemies can shoot at you when you pass them. I think the spiders in Titania. There's some spiders, and I think, oh, maybe it's some um, Macbeth. But if you don't destroy them. When you go past them, they'll actually shoot you. Hmm. So they'll shoot you in the back. <laughs> Which is... It's supposed to get you to kill them naturally before you run past them. You can still uh, barrel roll the shots that come in from behind you, but it can be a little unexpected because most of the enemies, once you pass them, are gone. You know? uh, in general, the game's difficulty... People, I've seen people say it's quite a hard game. I think it takes at least a uh, game over or two before you really get into the mindset of exactly how this game plays. Yeah. yeah. After that, I don't think it's too hard. It's quite unforgiving, because when you hit anything, especially obstacles, you lose a lot of health. Yeah, and you if you do. accidentally miss a checkpoint, then you're in a lot of trouble, because a checkpoint gives you three quarters health, two thirds health, that's about that much. Yeah. And if well, you miss also, one of those... There's yeah. also the extra lives, too, which you have to actually shoot 
And those yeah. only appear once or twice throughout the game. Uh, there's only a few spots they appear. Yeah, you have to shoot like you have to shoot the ring three times for the life to appear. It's not too difficult. The uh, course three, which I believe is just called stage three. I think the different courses yeah. are called stages. But I think yep. we'll call them courses just because that seems to make way more sense. Yeah. Anyway, in course three, that's actually quite a difficult course. That one's. It oh, is yes. very hard, yes. Especially, you can tell something's wrong when, like, the second level in that course, or, like, the asteroid, which, you know, it's vaguely similar to the asteroid on course one. But in this one, there are asteroids that fly past you that have troll faces on them. You know yeah, you're the troll face asteroids. Yeah, those things freaked me out when I was a kid. Like, I just love that they th that it's such an obvious you're screwed sort of moment in a game. It's like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have gone on this past year. You know, I? I'm pretty sure they reused that those asteroids because they're identical to the moon in uh, Majora's Mask. <laughs> you're right. They're very similar. Yes. They have that just that beating grin. Yeah. They're they are scary because they, they're really terrifying. Like. Most of the things in this game, I would say, are grounded in science fiction, but then these, these, there's just asteroids with these horrifying grins on them that fly at you and you can't kill them. The game's hands out continues, but it's that uh, do well to get continues system. The first two continues you can get are for 15,000 and 30,000 respectively. I'm not sure what it is after that point, if you can even in fact get more continues. Um, I'm, I did, I'm definitely right that you can get three. So, yeah. So it's probably 50,000 if I had to guess. Which at that point is kind of silly. I reckon if you get 50,000 points, you don't need continues. Well, you got to remember, you don't get scored when you uh, die in a level. You have to beat the level, yeah. Yeah. Kind of cute little Nintendo feature. Basically, you can access the black hole from uh, course one. I think it's in the asteroid belt, the second stage. But the trick with the black hole is that it's a sort of bonus level, which you can exit to go to different levels. The cool thing is, the black hole can kick you out into other stages, or courses rather, so you can get kicked out to course 2 or 3. I thought this was kind of neat because it reminds me of warp pipes in the Super Mario games, where if you're wanting to skip ahead, the game doesn't have cheats to do it, but you can enter the black hole and then jump way far ahead into a course that you aren't necessarily ready for, which I think is nice if you're not great at the game. You could definitely go into course one, then use the black hole to play some of the difficult levels that you would otherwise have a lot of trouble getting to. I thought that was a neat little feature. One thing I will say that I like about the way the difficulty works in this game is that each difficulty, or I should say each course, has a completely different level progression to it. Like there are levels that have similar names or that are vaguely similarly similarly or vaguely similar in terms of theme, such as, you know, there's an asteroid on course one and there's an asteroid on course two but they both play vastly differently. Now, some of some of the past, I think, recycle bosses. I know the, the boss for Sector X and for Asteroid on Course 1 is is the weird waffle maker looking thing. I forget what it's called. Actually, no, yeah, I... Sector X had a different boss. I thought it, I thought it had the waffle maker they, on they, it. I don't think any bosses repeat themselves. Are, are you sure? I think in Corneria, Course 1 and 2 have a very similar boss. Yeah, Course 1 and 2 yeah. have the same boss. Course 3 actually has this weird tank thing. Right. Yeah. Um, I think maybe uh, on Venom, I think there might be a repeat or a similar boss. Andros is the same on difficulty Course 1 and 2, I think. He's not very different between those two. Almost the same in Course 3. He has a little extra thing where he sort of becomes a demon head and just yeah. goes bananas. But it's not a fundamentally different boss, he just does a little bit of the extra. The only difference I can think of in the uh, the first and second Andros bosses is that he can reform on his uh, second form. The first one, oh, okay. I don't think he does that, because he's... If you look at his cube when you uh, fight him every course, he, it has a different shape to it. Like, the first one would just be like a straight Andros cube. The second one will have like these little triangles on top, and the third one will look a little more rounded. I didn't actually realize he couldn't reform because in the I only did one run of course one since I got through it straight away and when he turned into cube I just immediately bombed him and finished the the course so I <laughs> I didn't even realize he couldn't reform. I think all the planets have pretty unique bosses or at least most of the, the planets have fairly unique bosses. Oh I know which one's repeated. No, what is it? I don't know. I don't know any of these bosses' names, but it's the core boss where you go inside a planet or you yes. go inside a um, base station and it's a core. And in one iteration of that boss, you fight. You have to just shoot the um, you shoot the component, the uh, laser things, and then it opens up the core. 
right. whereas in the other one, if you shoot, you have to shoot them to open up the core, but you can reactivate them by accident if you shoot them twice. And also the core uh, shoots um, lasers or enemies at you in that second edition of it. There were enemies in the first one, too. Okay, but there, he definitely shoots back, which I don't right. think he did in the, the other one. He does, he does. He, he shoots the uh, laser balls. Oh, he shoots the laser I think in the other one, I think in this one he shoots the non-laser ball. I think he shoots the uh, faster R-wing style bullets. I don't have anything to complain about because seriously, the, what is there? There's like 15 or 17, including the iterations of Venom, there's almost 20 stages to this game. Yeah. And more or less, you've got 15-ish bosses. Which, if you think about it, is actually a load of bosses. Yeah, especially for at that time. It's about as many bosses as you could expect from a treasure game, essentially. Yeah. With about at least as much, like, depth between them. That's very nice. Um, on the downside with this game, uh, it's really unavoidable to get around this, but the frame rate is between tolerable to kind of just bad. Yeah. There are points where you'll just slow down, or... Like, you can tell they were really struggling in certain places, like in Sector Z. I don't think that the columns are invisible or transparent because they wanted to do it just for an effect. I think they did it because they put too many on screen and it just couldn't render them all. Yeah. <laughs> like, and even then it's lagging all over the place. Even in some it... places you wouldn't expect it to lag, it kind of does. Like, on the, uh, what is it, the Armada stage. Like the like when you find when you enter the final uh, carrier or the final ship and then you're it does that automatic cutscene where you're flying down through that um tube, that is like one of the lowest frame rates I have seen so far in the game. It's like maybe five or ten frames a second of you just flying down this tube very slowly. Maybe it's I think maybe it must be like loading something into the the RAM while it's doing that. I think it's that. just the way they did the cutscenes. You know, I wondered that though. I wondered if it was a loading thing because you can skip some of the cutscenes. Like you can ki you can skip the mission briefings before a stage. Right. But I noticed on uh, Corneria, you absolutely cannot skip the uh, All Fighters launching section, and that's also one that kind of chugs a little bit. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's up with that, but there is a little bit of chug here and there. It wouldn't be much of a problem because for the most part it works, except I'm pretty sure that it screws up your barrel rolling. Yeah. Again, the way the um. Well, the way the frame rate works in this game is that unlike most games that have slowdown, where the game will slow down, um, it doesn't allow you to dodge more effectively. Like in a typical shmup, if the game has slowdown or, you know, it gets really choppy, usually you can still dodge things effectively. I know that's the case in Thunder Force 4. In this, when the frame rate drops, the game just, like, the controls turn to, like, mush. Like, putty, like, it's just, like... You're actively starting to fight the controls to get them to respond, and it's just really annoying. It's not the good kind of frame rate drop. Something like Metal Slug, when they slow down, it almost increases the playability of the game because it lets you get like a, a bullet time. When you're dropping your frames down to sub tens, it's very awkward to just play. And then when you're trying to dodge and your barrel roll doesn't activate because it just it doesn't register, ugh. It, it adds a little bit of extra frustration. I really wish that they uh, had found time to release this on the follow-up FX2 chip, or it, remake it into a, um, you know, I, I don't know, just remake. Just a straight the, remake, uh, just with better frame rate, or? Yeah, just like, just update it, or just emulate it. Uh, their camera toggle button is pretty handy, although I don't usually find that you need a different camera angle because there's one that's just kind of too close to your R-wing, which makes dodging difficult, and it doesn't make yeah. it easier to aim. Then in the space stages, I personally don't like to use the crosshair, just because I really like to be able to see where my R-wing is and get positioned to everything else. I actually like the first-person camera. I mean, it works well enough in the um, space stages. And... The first-person camera angle reminds me of the games that inspired Star Fox, like I mentioned. They specifically, the Argonaut team mentioned Solaruru and Starblade as probably influences on Nintendo. And in those, as in the uh, first person mode, you can absolutely completely see it. Um, I like it just because it's easier to aim. It also speeds the game up a bit because it doesn't also have to render the R-Wing itself. That helps. Right. I don't know, I always prefer first person views in these sort of games, even if you don't have a complete feel or com you don't know exactly where your ship is. There's some ambiguity there. But I, I don't know, I like that. It's like you have to learn how the R-Wing feels, quote-unquote. And I know that's really pretentious to say, but you have to kind of realize where it is in space without actually being able to see it, which is actually kind of a nice... Not an effect, exactly, but it's just... It kind of adds to the atmosphere of the game, I guess. 
It's like yeah. you're actually flying the craft itself when you can actually see it from first person. I can see that. The biggest problem I have is barrel rolling feels just flimsy in first person. Yeah, that's the big issue because obviously if they had the camera rotate entirely, that one might not have been doable. It might have uh, been too um, intensive on the chip. Secondly, um, it would probably be vomit inducing for a number of people just to have the whole thing spin around like 50 billion times. Yeah. But yeah, it's just it's a little tricky to tell what's going on because the only way to tell your barrel rolling is you can see the uh, green Crosshair. lines around the edge. Yeah, which you're supposed to represent your wings, actually. However, <laughs> I actually found the first-person mode in Star Fox 64 a lot harder to use. Well, you're, you're actually inside the awing in that, right? Like yeah, you can see the cockpit itself, so there's part of the screen being clipped, essentially. Which is kind of a fair balance for the fact that you, you know, you're looking at it from a different perspective. There's a pretty impressive set of levels um, on display here in this game. So the game is generally split into two parts. You have the planet stages, and then you have the space stages. And on the planet stages, you know, you, you can't use the first-person camera there. You're mostly dodging obstacles and such, flying through things. The planet stages, I'd say, steal the show. They really yeah. do, because they, have, they generally have a lot more interesting uh, backgrounds. Like, it's not just like a star field. Like the first planet, you've got the green, you've got the green grass fields, and then the mountains in the distance, and then you have the um, the skyscrapers that pop up that you can um, fly between, which is really cool actually. That that's such a great way to start off this game, and it the first stage even changes depending on which course you take. So on course yeah. like three, it's actually you're actually playing through the, the that stage on uh, sunset. Okay. Yeah, you're flying through it uh, during the sunset. I don't know, it's just an effective set piece and opening to any game I've seen. Yeah. It's very memorable. Like, even if you don't like the game, you can probably... you could. Most people would probably agree that the first stage is good, even if they don't like the game. So. Yeah, well, you go from the first stage, and then you have to go to a space stage. Yeah, that's that's true. All the courses um start off with a space stage after Corneria. And they, de they do vary, like, on course one, it's just, you know... Course one, um, it's asteroids just asteroids, just... and you get like a few blocks floating around, but you don't have too much to dodge there. And then Sector X is like some sort of construction field or something. There's like all these spinning yeah, pylons in space. space yeah. And then in the asteroid two, which is on the third course, it's like troll face asteroids just pretty much beating the crap out of you, like it's stealing a bunch of money. Stuff, and there's a few yeah. different ends. Yeah. The boss is also completely different on that one, so that's pretty cool. The whole game's levels, there is a surprisingly large amount of effort, I would say, put into the levels. Like, I was actively looking forward to going to the different planets, because they're really cool. Like, each planet is a completely different style of planet, really. You've got an ice planet, which uh, is full of... I really like how almost all of Andros's generals have a giant A on their forehead. <laughs> a is for asshole. Just like Andrew's like, all right, everyone put on the hats. Put on the hats with the A on it. You gotta wear the A hats. I don't want to wear an A hat. Do they have to wear it when like they go home? Like they have to put on like a sleeping cap and it has A on it and like <laughs> ass they hats. To, they have to wear like everything they wear has to be endorsed by Andros. Like it has to be like made by his company. Yeah, it's like an Andros merchandising thing. So you gotta spread the brand. <laughs> we want everybody to know who it is that's oppressing them wide open areas. I think you go through a canon, canyon at one point through it. Right. Then you then you actually uh, have to heat it up and turn it to like a hot planet and it does a cool yep. little effect, which is that's really neat. You fly through doors and stuff, you get to open things. You've got a, you've got Fortuna, which I, I think, I guess, Fortuna is probably going to be everyone's favorite planet if they get yes. to it. It's such a nice planet. It's got this amazingly catchy tune. It's also got some, I don't think it's necessarily the music, but the enemies have a very organic sort of sounds yep. they make, so it's, it feels very alive, and you, you fly over grasslands, and there's giant flowers that, really cool looking flowers that pop out, and they, you know, you gotta dodge them or shoot them. Then you fly over an ocean, and it's just, there's fish leaping out trying to kill you, or dragons, or whatever. And the boss is a dragon himself, and he's one of the more visually impressive bosses, because most of the bosses are structural ship sort of things, whereas he's almost organic, he's this, he's a dragon with two heads, that's that's all he is. I really, lots of the planets are great. I found, yeah, the sectors and the space levels are 
they're okay. The thing is, to me, the reason that the space planets aren't as, space levels aren't that interesting is you're sort of you got levels like that in other 3D games. Like they had the same sort of feeling where it's just you fly through a star field because star fields uh, don't take much graphical power and you, you shoot things. There's not as much charm to those levels. The special exception is Sector Y, which you fly through like an organic, like living ecosystem of space manta rays. Then a giant whale appears. Very odd stage. I think that Sector Y is completely removed from Star Fox 64. That's which a I, shame. I, I, Jeez. Yeah, like there's a Sector Y, but it's not that stage. It's right. just, I think. I, I don't remember if it's Sector X or Y, but it's one of the stages Great Fox breaks down in Star Fox 64 and you have to protect it from missiles. I don't know if that's X or Y. So they removed one of the stages in favor of a defense slash escort mission. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I don't know. They, <laughs> Let's I replace guess this would... really great set piece with the most annoying stage in any given game imaginable. I think they were just trying to strip out the organic elements from Star Fox 64 when they made it for the 64. Because there's not nearly as much organic sort of visuals to it. Which is strange because Star Fox Assault kind of brought it back in a lot yeah. of ways. That was a very organic game. Which is actually kind of cool. It's kind of, um, it's kind of provides a nice contrast to like the sleek fighter craft you're, pl you're flying in. Um, I will say I like the Armada stage a lot too, because that's, that's just, that's such a cool set piece in any shmup. And you actually get to yeah. fly inside of them in 3D. And like blow up the cores and then fly out yep. really quickly. I would almost say it was inspired by Independence Day if the movie Independence Day hadn't come out, what, a year later? I think uh, it was 19, 94, 96, somewhere around there. I, got I, I remember playing Star Fox before yeah, Independence I remember Day that game came out. thing before that movie as well. So, probably the most blatantly impressive aspect of Star Fox was that in 1993 it was effectively a full three dimensional game more or less, for the SNES, which looks, still looks, it looks okay today, it definitely looks I think odd. it's the presentation, it, it looks, it still looks good because you can appreciate what they were doing with the tech right. at the time, and two, the, what they did with the graphics is, it's very consistent, like the art style is consistent with the graphics in an odd sort of way, they play off of each other. They made the most of the tech and you can tell. There's there's some really cool stuff in Star Fox, though. So even like compared to other 3D games that I'm aware of, they really pushed like some really neat little features in here and there. Yeah. Like I mentioned Fortuna, but the way the plants like pop up, it looks really cool, and they curve and they bend as they pop up. And you've got this railroad track on Titania, which is like just this really cool like space railroad it's a really simple effect but it looks really cool venom has a similar thing where you're actually flying along what feels like the edge of a giant like railroad or like pyramid or something oh you're yeah the carrot along. sticks that um andros is throwing at you <laughs> well okay that's not technically canon he didn't have the big hands in um the original game so i guess nope. he's spitting out the carrot sticks at you <laughs> I love that that's his main attack. He shoots cute, or he shoots like pillars from, or he shoots out, uh, what is he it, like rectangles Zevious, from his eyes? Yeah. Zevious, uh mirror thingies. And then he sucks them up and spits them back out at you. He like, it's telekinesis or something, like that's just telekinetic powers, because never... he shoots it from his eyes. You know they never do explain whether that final boss fight actually happened, or if like you entered some sort of trippy void. You coincidentally somehow blow up a critical system and then fly out. <laughs> yeah. I... I know in Star Fox Adventure that he's actually a giant space head, which is really yeah. funny. That was so dumb. Which is also really dumb because it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, hello, I'm just Andros. I'm gonna just be, I'm just chilling out, waiting for you to like, you know, crawl on your R wing off of this stupid dinosaur planet and then shoot me full of lasers until I die. You wanna fight General oh. Scales? Too bad. <laughs> Doesn't it, doesn't it turn out like you're flying to something and you think it's one thing and then he turns around and it's like, Hi, Fox! Yeah. He, he, he's, he's just the uh, Krizoa head and then it just turns around and then, oh. <laughs> I like game. to imagine that uh, Andros is the uh, giant floating head from Zardos. <laughs> he just goes from planet to planet telling people their penises are evil. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, this game looks it looks great. This is this you can tell that the FX chip is doing something really yeah. really impressive. It's entirely and they paid so impressive. much attention to detail too. Like even the shadow. If you look at the shadow of the R wing, like if you lose a wing, it'll reference that. Yeah, there's other sort of like other things that cast shadows and stuff too, and it's really just neat 
saying all the little details you were able to squeeze out of the, um, the super effects. Now, granted, that does come at a b pretty big cost. As we noted, the frame rate just takes a massive dive in right. some areas. Also, it should be noted that uh, Argonaut's team at one point joked that the SNES was actually just a big fancy box to hold the Super FX chip. So that should tell you everything you need to know about the actual SNES's capabilities for rendering 3D graphics. Which is a pretty reasonable suggestion if you do look at the games that did 3D on the SNES. There's, There's like two, I think. I think Steel Talents is one, and that the actual craft was i think a sprite so it, it moved smoother but then it was actually choppier than the genesis version somehow the genesis well, version was pretty choppy too yeah the genesis version is choppy. okay um so on the subject of the sort of the r wing and the effects they have applied to it the game's sound effects have some really cool little features there's some fake doppler effect going on when you fly past buildings i think maybe some of the lasers have this kind of doppler ish thing when they if you just barely miss them yeah i know you you definitely have that whooshing sound yeah. as you fly past things, which is really nice. And I know that the uh, your allies' engines, if they get close to you, you can hear the, the hum of their engines. Yeah, yep. some of the bosses are like that too, I think. Yeah, some of the bosses, when they fly over you, they make that sort of sound. Like, it really, it does add to the impact that you're you are flying around it's pretty neat um it has some voice sampling but it's creepy it's ugh. yeah they actually have some there it's kind of weird okay so in game like you have that your like co-pilot's heads like pop up and they're they're like muppets and they're like mama, 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 mama. Or, or if you're falco's like mama, 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 mama. i love falco's voice because everyone has got like four or five octaves above him <laughs> he's just like wop, 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 wop. <laughs> He was just, you know, he's just beatboxing. That's all. That's Falco's <laughs> deal. He was just beatboxing and like listening to dubstep. He would. <laughs> he does seem like the kind of jerk that would, doesn't he? <laughs> would but then you've got some actual voices in there. I mean, you got like in the initial opening where it's like emergency, right. emergency. But you get this really creepy voice when you need to continue. I can't quite remember what he says, but it's something. He just goes, "Let's go." And then you have like the when you beat the game, it actually gives you like, a, oh, good job, Fox. Now, now come home, please. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like this like empty, hollow voice, which is just. Oh. This is Corneria. Oh, they did the oh. best they could. It's better than the trumpet farts. There's really not that many trumpet farts. No. This no. This game has an amazing soundtrack. Actually, I should note about the whole trumpet farting thing. We have this thing in um, GC9X where we did, where we've discussed SNES music a number of times. And a lot of the games seem to use this really cheesy sounding horn sample and it sounds like a farting trumpet. So like, you'll have this great composed song. Like, I think a good example would be Castlevania IV. That's got some great, well-designed or well-composed pieces. It's just the instrument choices were a bit suspect. And to be completely fair, um, I have listened to synthesized music outside of the SNES and that, that does actually show up in just actual commercial songs you can sometimes hear. Yeah, funny. you would think they would they would have shied away from the trumpets pretty early on. Unfortunately, for those of you who've not realized that they're fighting trumpets, you're just going to hear fighting trumpets from now on. It's it's one of those you can't unhear it once you just hear the synthesized like, <laughs> like um, yeah. <laughs> it's not the best, but this game completely avoids it. I I'm thinking because it's a Nintendo first party game, they could use whatever samples they wanted, and they use that to great effect. It's some of my favorite music on the SNES, and there's a real diverse array of music in this. Like the opening Corneria music, it's kind of like just a electronic rock ballad almost, just with the way they've got some very twangy uh, guitar sounds going on. Fortuna has, as we mentioned, this just amazing, like funky, like a groovy beat to it and stuff like Titania has because it's an ice themed planet so it's a very very chill sort of smooth sounds with the slight uh, crystal tinge to it I guess I don't know how to describe that exactly but it's it sounds great and it's funny because the guy that composed it is a man named uh, Hajime Hirasawa I think is how it's pronounced yeah Hirasawa uh, and incredibly he only did two soundtracks for Nintendo um, the other one was some time twist game for the, the Famicom Disk System. And then he quit just after Star Fox, he left. And that was, that's basically all the music he's done for games. He went on to make ringtones or something for a company he created, bizarrely enough. Um, he came back for Super Smash Bros. Brawl just to rearrange his Space Armada uh, track from Star Fox, and that's it. 
It's the only thing you've done, and it doesn't sound like a normal Nintendo game. It has elements of Nintendo's sort of style to it, but it does sound decidedly different to almost, well, especially for their SNES output. It does a little bit, yeah. It's, I noticed the music isn't, it's not exactly orchestral like a lot of SNES music is. It's, like you said, it there. it's got more of an edge to it, I guess. I'm not sure to explain it exactly. It feels less like a chiptune music and sort of almost more like standard synthesized electric music it doesn't have as much of a chip sound. I like the fact that the pretty much all the themes go really well with the planets that they're on or the levels that they're chosen for. Like, there's no bad track in this game. There are some that don't stand out, but there's just no notably bad music anywhere. Even if you hate the music, um, you'd probably find it more inoffensive than you would find it outright bad. I actually like the music in this a lot, so I'm not one of those people. I don't know how you could hate the music. Yeah, it, it'd be very difficult. You'd have to be a very mad, angry person to hate the music well, in this game. if you don't like synthesized music, you probably wouldn't. But yeah, I don't know why you would be playing an SNES game if you couldn't stand this sort of music, because they sort of go hand in hand with the system. While most of the time Star Fox 64 is probably the better game, I think the SNES music is surprisingly pretty much superior to anything else in the Star Fox franchise. I totally agree. Now, did anyone have anything else to sort of say about Star Fox just in general as Are a there game? minor details? Like, the only thing that I would I like to mention is uh, just a special call out to the Manta Ray, the giant Manta Ray in Sector Y. It's the only enemy... Okay, it's one of two enemies in the game where you actually don't want to shoot it, because if you shoot it, it actually gets you know, pissed off and flies at you and tries to kill you. Whereas if you ignore it, it doesn't attack you and you can't kill it. So that's... <laughs> and the other ones would be the asteroids, I take it? That... Yeah, there's not the, uh, not the smiling asteroids, Obviously. but in the asteroid level, there's an enemy that if you shoot it, it shoots back at you. I think, yeah, yeah, I think there's a few. I know in a few instances, um, if a boss has like a reflective coating on it or something and you shoot it, uh, you shoot at a place other than its weak point and the laser bounces off, that can actually hit you 